worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. I choose to worship. It's all about loyalty. It's, you may be seated. It's all about loyalty. Have you ever been loyal to something? Huh? Or someone? When I was thinking about this loyalty and, and decision making and, and we're starting a new series about worship. And when I was thinking about that, I thought about this movie I had went and seen called Concussion. And it was about, it was based on a true story about the NFL. How many of you saw that movie? <clears throat> Amen, it was a really, really, really good movie. But one thing that stuck out in my head was that when the doctor had, had discovered that his patient had died or killed himself, and it was all because he had suffered a concussion while playing football. And, and he thought when he'd bring out the information and take it to the NFL, that they would receive the information and want to protect their players. But they was all about the money, right? And so this thing this guy said in the movie that really stuck out to me, he said that the NFL owns one day a week. He said, it's the same day that the church used to own. So what that said to me is that America is loyal to football. Yeah, they are. Think about it. And it's something that makes you want to go, mm, right? Because with the Super Bowl, come on, I love the Broncos. I'm loyal to the Broncos. And I will be sporting my orange and blue, but here's the thing. Has false worship interrupted true worship? I mean, think about it. Even the churches will adjust their schedules so that the congregation, because they know the congregation is going to want to watch the football game at a certain time, right? And they might not come to church that day. So we've even adjusted for football. We've even dressed. We have, me included. This is it. I'm just saying stuff that makes you go, mm. I I'm not making no judgment calls. Stuff that makes you go, mm, are we, Lord? Has false worship interrupted true worship? Stuff that makes you go, Hmm. Let's pray. Lord God, we love you this morning. We honor you and we bless you, God. And on this morning as we talk about worship, as we resolve to worship only you, Lord, as we make a conscious decision and choose to worship you, Lord, we just pray that we can find out those things that are not like you and get rid of them and not allow them to interrupt our false, interrupt our true worship of you. We love you. These and other blessings we ask in your son Jesus' name we pray, amen. Say amen. 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 Yeah, I'm gonna need y'all to talk back. Amen. So I'm gonna ask Eddie to put, to put my slides on the screen. So we're gonna be coming from Exodus. I need a little water. The book of Exodus. <clears throat> now, the theme of Exodus is God revealing himself to his people. So we know the story. The Egyptians were in bondage for 400 years, and they were slaves to, uh, I'm sorry, the Israelites were in bondage for 400 years by, by Egypt, and they were enslaved to a pharaoh who said he was a God. And so for 430 years, Israel probably had little or no relationship with the true and living God. And so the true and living God comes along and he delivers Israel from Egypt. And he does it in a, a mighty, 
huge supernatural way because he's going to, he's revealing himself to his people and so he delivers them he he takes them across the red sea he parts the water and then he gets rid of pharaoh's army and so now he's showing his people who he is that he's a strong and mighty god that can overcome all gods amen so they get to the other side of the red sea and then now he's going to teach them how to worship him. He's going to teach them how to worship him. So he gives them, them these rules and laws and commands and covenants. And he says, now I'm the God that took you out of Egypt. And so don't worship any other gods. Only worship me. And so then they get to the foot of this big mountain called Mount Sinai. And he t takes Moses, who is the mediator, who he's been using all along, and he takes Moses up to the mountain. Now, before Moses gets up on the mountain, he don't say, we're going to be up there a while. Or he don't tell Israel, we're going to be up there a while. He just takes him to the mountain. He says, come up to the mountain. And then he begins to show Moses the pattern of worship, how to worship him. And if you ever read or have read the book of Exodus, there's chapter after chapter, detail after detail, measurements of how he wants them to build this tabernacle that he wants to dwell in. And I mean, it could be a little boring, if you will, but... I read it because I thought, wow, God is showing us every simple, single, itsy, bitsy detail, even down to the color of the thread that he wanted for the curtains. So he's teaching Israel how to worship him, who he is. Here's the pattern I'm going to set for worship because I want to dwell among you and I don't dwell in unclean places. And then he even gives them the people and, and puts the spirit in the ones that he wants to build this temple and this tabernacle. And then we see at the end of the book, they begin to build the tabernacle, right? But right in the middle of him giving the pattern of them building the tabernacle, there's the golden calf right in the middle, an interruption. So my big idea is this. False worship will try to interrupt true worship. Amen. False worship will try to interrupt true worship. But when we choose when we make a conscious decision to worship only God, he will reward our loyalty. So Moses is on the mountain, and, and he's there a long time, about 40 days. And I looked up that number 40, and it means a time of testing. And we know Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days, and, 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 there's, a, and there's a lot of, in, in, you know, inferences to 40 in the Bible. So... Moses is away from Israel. God's not speaking to him. And it's a long time, it seems like. Y'all know how it is when you're waiting for God to answer, right? When you're waiting for him to answer, when you're waiting to hear from him, when you believe, when you're believing him for something and he don't answer. And a lot of times what we start to do is to form and create our own responses, our own answers. Amen. You know, I only know what I did, right? So I'm going to say this. I'm not picking on nobody, but we want to get married. And so we're waiting and waiting and waiting. And then we just decide to move in and shack up. You know, we make our own, we create our own responses. Amen. False worship will interrupt true worship. And so my, my preaching idea is this, resolve to worship only God. Resolve to worship only God. We don't want to replace God with a false idol and then call it God. Go to Exodus chapter 32. 
go to Exodus chapter 32. So like I said, Moses is, is on the mountain for 30 days and God is, 40 days and God has given him all this information. And then God tells him one day, you need to go on back down there to your people because they are messing up. Moses asked God to forgive him. They owe people, forgive them, God. Then Moses comes down and he has, God has put, put the Ten Commandments on, on some stone. Moses comes down with the Ten Commandments. You know, asking God to forgive him. He gets down and he sees him, he sees this golden calf. Now he mad. Here's why he's mad. Because that calf is the same type of worship that Egypt was doing. So they don't went back to what they got delivered from. Huh? 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 God delivers us from something or someone, and we get to a place where he's not speaking, and we don't know which way to go or where to go, and we sometimes tend to go back to where he delivered us from. And here's the biggest thing. They were worshiping this calf that they created and then they some of the worship that God had already spoken to them about about the sacrifices and and what to do to sacrifice what they had to do to make a sacrifice to him they were doing that too they were mixing their worship of God and the worship they had in Egypt sometimes we want to replace God with false things and then call it God we want to say God's in that. Amen. I don't know what your golden calf is. I just know what mine are. Yeah. Somebody might have a problem with sex outside of marriage, pornography, uh, drugs, alcohol, pride. I don't know what it is. But sometimes God will deliver us from those things. And while we're waiting in the wait, we tend to go back and dibble and dabble. And what he's delivered us from. Yeah. Yeah. But resolve to worship only him. So let's go to chapter 32. And we'll begin in verse 25. And I'm going to read 25 and 26. Are you there? It says, and I'll be reading from the ESV. And when Moses saw that the people had broken loose, in other words, gotten out of control, for Aaron had let them break loose to the derision of their enemies, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. Who's on the Lord's side? Come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered around him. He went to the gate of the camp and said, who is on the Lord's side and come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered him. Let's go to the next slide, which would be my first point. When God calls, our answer is based on the choice of whether or not we worship him, whether or not we decide to worship him. When God calls, our answer is it based on our choice of whether or not to worship him? Who's on the Lord's side? Come to me. And so here's what's going on. When Israel came out of Egypt, they were, they were in a formation that, like a military style. And so the son, there was 12 sons of Joshua, and Israel was broken up by the 12 descendants of Joshua's sons. Amen? And they formed a military, like a military, and it was called camp, an army. So here they are, an army, coming out of slavery. Ain't never fought nobody, probably. But God has them formed like an army, and when they get across the Red Sea, they're set up in camps. Now, I'm thinking their biggest battle and their hardest fight is with themselves. 
So they're set up like an army ready for battle, but their biggest battle is them. Amen? Amen? Isn't our biggest battle us? So their biggest battle is them, and they're setting up in camp. And like I said earlier, Deuteronomy 23 says that the Lord will move in and about your camp to deliver you from your enemies, but the camp must be holy. God will not dwell in unclean places. So he showed Moses how, he was, how they were to build the tabernacle in the center of the camp, and he was going to dwell among them, but he don't dwell in unclean places. And right now, the camp is unclean. The camp is unclean. So Moses goes to the, the entrance of the camp, and the entrance of the camp signifies a place of judgment because things that are not clean in the camp got to go. So he's standing at the entrance, and he's calling out, and it's a judgment call. Whose side are you on? It's a judgment call. And I say that because it needs to come from the heart. Your motives, our plans, our thoughts, our, where is our heart? Whose side are you on? And guess who steps up? The Levites. The worship team will appreciate this passage because I've asked them to look it over. Amen. <laughs> I asked them to look it over because we're considered Levites. So who stands up and rallies to Moses? None other but the Levites. Now, were they a part of this worship, idol worship? I'm sure. But like I said, it's a judgment call. Perhaps they repented. Perhaps they looked at their hearts and decided, hey, this is not for me. I, I'm for God. And we know as we study the Levites later, because in this passage is when they were initially ordained for service. This is their calling out. This is their ordination service. So the Levites have stepped up and, and said, I am for the Lord. For God, I live and for God, I die. I decided to make Jesus my choice. And they come and they gather around Moses. Now, what we have to understand about the Levites is that they have been set apart for the service of God. But that service is in the place of worship in the physical place of worship so the Levites they don't have no other job but to serve the place of worship and they are called God's own they're, they're God's own firstborn they belong to God because they only service the place of worship that's important they gave their they give their whole life their whole being everything to the place of worship. They carry the ark. They do the music. They teach the word. They do the sacrifices. Any ties that come to the tabernacle is to cover their well-being. Amen. Amen. So the Levites have been called and they're answering their call to give their life to Christ, everything they have. Even when Israel gets to the promised land, everybody gets a parcel of land, everybody gets an inheritance except the Levites. You know why? Their inheritance is God. So the Levites are answering the call. For God I live. For God I die. I was thinking about loyalty. And it's so funny what we're loyal to. It's really, really weird. I pulled up this um, lyrics to this rap song. I'm just going to say a little bit of it. I ain't even going to try to rap it. I'm just going to tell you. It, it's 50 Cent talking about loyalty. And he says this, would you ride for me? And the, the person responds, you ain't even got to ask. He said, would you die for me? They said, they blast you, they blast me. He talking about another dude. <laughs> you know, he'll die for him. 
He'll ride for him. When we think about loyalty, what are we loyal to? Whose side are we on? Really? Really? When we look into our hearts and our mind, really, what choice have we made? Is it for God I live and for God I die? Okay, so you might say, well, that was a Levite back over there at Mount Sinai. What did that have to do with me? Well, when we get to the New Testament, guess what? The Christians, we're considered the Levites. It's not only the singers and the musicians, because Peter said that, that we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Not only that, the tabernacle that they were constructing that was to be in the midst of the camp, that God was to dwell in, guess what? We're the tabernacle that he dwells in. God is calling us to be a Levite to the place of worship. Whose side are you on? What do you choose? Good or evil? What do you choose? Right or wrong? What do you choose? A golden calf or an almighty God? Whose side are you on? Hallelujah. Because false worship will try to interrupt true worship, but we have to choose to worship God. So when he issues the call, we have to make the choice. And our answer should be whether we're going to worship God wholly or totally or not. Whose side are you on? Now back to my initial introduction about the NFL. I think what this is saying, what God is saying is we need to get our Sunday back. We need to get our Sunday back. God wants his Sunday back. God wants his Sunday back to people of God. God wants his Sunday back. I don't know how that's going to look for you. Maybe you need to DVR the game. Pastor Derek does that, I know. Need to DVR the game. I don't know. Start with our children, not participating on things on Sunday. God wants his Sunday back. That is our time of worship as a group, as a family, as a community. That's our time to come together. And if we're putting God, if we're interrupting true worship with false worship, God wants his Sunday back. <laughs> yeah, get rid of the idols. That's what God is saying. Get rid of the idols. Let's go to our next point. Look at verses 27 through 28. Yeah, we got to take it back. <laughs> take back those things that are not of God or get them out of the way. Beginning with verse 27. And he said to them, that's the Levites, Moses is speaking to the Levites. He said to them, thus says the Lord God of Israel, put your sword on your side, each of you, and go to and fro from gate to gate throughout the camp, and each of you, listen, kill his brother and his companion and his neighbor. <laughs> yeah, let me say that again, because I mean, I was like, what? He said, put your sword on your side, each of you, and go to and fro from gate to gate throughout the camp, and each of you kill his brother, his companion, and his neighbor. And the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and that day about 3,000 Men of the people fell. Yeah, let's go to my point. When we choose to worship God, 
we have to get rid of our false idols. When we choose to worship God, we have to get rid of our false idols. Like I said earlier, God doesn't dwell in unclean places. And so now he's putting the Levites to the test. You chose to worship me. Yeah, let me just see. Let me see. And he says to them, get this sword and put it on your side. Well, let's look at the sword for a minute. It was a common, it was a common weapon of war. And, and they were usually handheld. And they had two edges. And the sword was an offensive war weapon. You know, like on football, the offense is the quarterback, running back, wide receiver, offensive line. That's the offense. They're trying to score, right? The defense is trying to stop them from score. This sword is an offensive weapon. Okay, so that means you trying to, you trying to do, you're not trying to protect or defend nothing. Amen. It's an offensive weapon. And it represents or symbolizes aggression, power, authority. And, and it also um, symbolizes metaphorically, check this out, judgment. Remember Moses standing at the gate of judgment? Now they're saying, take the sword. It symbolizes judgment. And one other thing, it symbolizes the word of God. It symbolizes the word of God. So when we choose to worship God, we have to get rid of the false idols. So the Levites are put to the test. You've chosen me. Take this sword and go into the camp and systematically kill. What does that mean? Let's see. There was over 2 million Israelites that came from Egypt. So I highly doubt they, in one day, addressed 2 million people. And when you think about the culture and the customs in that time, it was probably men that they addressed or whatever. And then some commentators think it was probably either the people that initiated the, the golden calf um, idol worshiping, or it could have been leaders. We don't know exactly who. We don't know exactly the criteria. But what we do know is that they went through the camp and killed 3,000, and it said your brother, your, your companion, your neighbor. And so we do know that happened. So based on what I said the sword was, I'm kind of thinking they were asking these people to make a judgment call. I'm kind of thinking they were asking them whose side are they on. And see, before Moses brought down the Ten Commandments on a stone, God had already given the Ten Commandments to, the, to Israel verbally and already given them um, laws, and they'd already made a covenant. And wrote, Moses, it said, had wrote it in a book called Law. So I kind of think, called the Book of Law, so I kind of think the Israelites were preaching. I don't know, that's just Karen. I think because they had their sword... I think they were preaching, and I think they were calling people to repentance or not. And I kind of believe the people that rejected God were the ones that were killed. And whether it was their own family or not, they had to do it. They had to kill and get them out of the camp because what? God doesn't dwell in unclean places. Amen. And so they were to kill. And I looked up that word kill in the Hebrew because, you know, it's a verb, and, it, and I'm curious. And, Mel, boy, it was, like, really insightful because the, the Hebrew word for kill means kill. 
It means kill. And it takes on a, a connotation of a vicious, vicious killing. And the gra- I looked up the grammar, and it's in the active voice. And it has a, um, impa- and it's an imperative mood, which means a command. Second person command. So we know first person is, I did something. But this is God talking to them, so he's saying, you, second person. He commanded the Levites to kill. What does that mean to me? Let's, let's go practical. Let's go practical. Those, that golden calf that's in your life, that golden calf that has interrupted true worship. I believe what God is saying is to, to, to get your sword, the word of God, Go home, systematically go through your life and think about those things that are dear and near to your heart. Because he said, kill your brother, your son, your neighbor. That's something that's near and dear to your heart that has your heart strings because God wants your heart strings. I'm thinking he's, he's saying to us, yeah, get your sword Get your word of God because this was a judgment call. And if it don't line up, if it don't line up with my word, get rid of it. Because, see, I don't dwell in unclean places. Get rid of it. If we choose to worship God, we have to get rid of the false idols. Because, see, false worship interrupts true worship. And we have to choose who we will serve Are we going to serve God? Are we going to serve ourselves? And we have to be the one to decide to kill, to get rid of. We have to make the choice. We have to make the decision. Amen. Now I'm not saying just go home tonight and kick, kick out Ray Ray and whoever. You know, sometime it, and sometimes it's your kids. Sometimes it's your pride. I don't know. Sometimes it, it's something that we have put in the place of God, and then we, we try to call it God. You know, when my kids were born, both of them, I, I gave them back to God. I had my own little ritual all by myself. I gave them back to God. But many, 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 many times through their life, I have taken them back from God, and I have been their God, and they have been my false worship because I've done things for them that God should have done or wanted to do, amen, but I would do it. And so what God is saying is, kill it. Hey, kill it. Whatever it is, y'all know, get out your Bible Get on your knees and let God reveal to you what, that's if you want to worship God. That is if you want to resolve to worship God. Yeah, get on your knees and make that judgment call. Hallelujah, God. Preach to yourself. Because remember, I said you were a Levite of this place of worship. Get your word, give your own self a word from the Lord. So he's commanding us to kill it, resolve to worship only God. And I'm coming to a landing, y'all. We're going to our third point, verse 29, the last verse in this section. It says, and Moses said, today you have been ordained for the service of the Lord each one at the cost of his son and of his brother, so that he might bestow a blessing upon you this day. So when we are obedient to God, this is my last point, when we are obedient to God, he will reward our loyalty to him. He'll reward our loyalty. Yeah, are you going to ride for him? Do I even have to ask? Are you going to die for him? <laughs> if, if, if they blast him, are they blasting you? 
He'll reward our loyalty if we're obedient to him. So first we need to decide whose side are we on. And once we make that decision, we need to go through the camp and kill those things that are not like him. And if we're obedient, he will ordain us for service. So he took the Levites and he set them apart for service. He appointed them. He consecrated them because they obeyed his command. They cleaned up the camp and now God can come close. God can tabernacle. The worship team was singing a song that said, I'm waiting here for you. He's waiting for us to clean up. And so they cleaned up and he's anointing and ordaining and setting apart and consecrating because he wants to bless us. And I heard William McDowell say this one time, our reward of worship is God, is Jesus. Sometimes we're waiting on, I don't know what kind of a reward, maybe, maybe him to answer our prayer. But if we truly worship him, our reward to worship God is him. Hallelujah, it's him, it's God. We want him to direct our paths. We want him to, to move things out of the way. We want him to do what he wants to do, not what we want to do. The reward is God. Our reward is being in his presence. Hallelujah, amen. And so this is how we can apply it. We can do those things he's asked us to do, and then we can allow him to control our lives, and then he will bless us. He will bless us for our loyalty to him. He will bless us for our faithfulness to him. He will bless us, like Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, it's not that I've already obtained all this or I'm already perfect, but I press to make it my own. He said, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. He said, I do not consider that I have made it on my own. He said, but one thing I do... I forget those things that are behind me. Yeah, they don't distract me no more. They don't interrupt my true worship anymore. I forget those things and I strain. I strain. I press on toward the goal for the prize. And that prize is in Christ Jesus. Yeah, he wants to reward us for our worship, for our choosing to worship him. And Peter said this, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will will never fade. Yes, he's waiting for us to worship only him, to get rid of those interruptions and to worship him truly for he has an, a reward waiting for us. And in Revelation, in Revelation, Jesus said, look, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me and I will give to each person according to what they have done. He said, because I am the alpha. I am the omega, I am the beginning, I am the ending, I am the first, I am the last. I have my reward with me. He's looking for true worshipers. Yeah. Whose side are you on? Whose side are you on? Who do you choose? Do you choose good? Do you choose bad? Do you choose God? Come on, whose side are you on? Amen. I resolve to worship God. I resolve to worship God. Come on, stand to your feet and make the declaration. I resolve to worship you, God. I resolve to worship only you. I love you, Lord. I give you my heart. I give you my mind. I give you my soul. Just like the Levites, I sacrifice everything that I am to you for your service. Service. Hallelujah. Come on and let's give him some praise in here. Come on, let's give him some praise. Yeah, we don't make no noise no more, but we'll make some noise at the football game. God wants to take Sunday back. Let's make some noise like we were at the football game. Yeah, come on. Come on. He wants his Sunday back. Amen. Hallelujah. Give him some praise in this place. Worship him. Honor him. Bless him. Come on. Come on. Give him praise. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah. 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 I worship you, Lord. I worship you, God. I worship you. Hallelujah. 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 Yes, God. Here's what I want everybody to do right now. 
right where you're at in your seat, just begin to cry out and pray in your own way and, and ask God to search your heart, to search your mind, to make that judgment call and to show you, reveal to you those things that are not like him. Reveal to you what is interrupting your true worship of him. What has gotten in the way? And ask him to give you the strength. Ask him to show you in his word. Ask him to show you how to get rid of it, how to kill it, how to move it out the way. Right now, where you are at your seat, cry out to him. Cry out to him. Come on, cry out to him. Come on. 